Hey, what's going on, family? It's your favorite uncle, cousin Tyrone Gregory, the self-employed tax guy here in 2022. You know what? Memes are a wonderful thing. Meme, M-E-M-E, memes, right? Did I say that? I think I said the right memes. And one of my favorite memes this year so far is this one. Emotional damage. Man, I am getting on everybody nerves in my house. Every time that there's a joke pass and I see they express it, I'm yelling, emotional damage. Like that is just the funniest thing in my house. But on a serious tip, emotional damage is real. Emotional damage is something that a lot of real people uh, deal with in, in, in reality, right? It happens. Emotional trauma um, is real. So that's why I'm super excited in today's video to share with you a conversation that I had with my brother who is... Um, a clinical social worker. He helps people deal with emotional trauma from the past and help them improve their lives. And when we are self-employed, emotional balance and emotional intelligence and health is extremely important to us because we and our business are one and the same. If we're not doing well, our business is not doing well, right? If we're not you know, mentally there, if we're having cloudy days and not being able to focus, then we are unproductive in our business, especially if we are solopreneurs and it's just us. Whatever happens to us as individuals is going to affect what happens to us in our business. So it's important that we understand, recognize, and do our best to get that under control so that we can be more uh, healthier, right? That we can be less stressed, that we can be more productive and therefore more profitable. So please watch the video. I know it's a, it's a long one, right? Because we talk about a lot with this one, but you can watch it in its entirety, take notes, get yourself together and uh, don't have no emotional damage. Let's go. What is going on, family? It is your favorite uncle, cousin Tyrone Gregory, the self-employed tax guy. And as you can see on your screen, we have a very, very special guest in the building here to join us today to enlighten us on uh, emotional health, right? Emotional balance. This guy is my brother, my, my I'm going to call him my big bro, even though I'm the oldest. I mean, he, he's That's big him. because he works out more than me. So you can see he flexing over there on us real quick. But he is, oh, wow. <laughs> 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 he is. Well, well this, you know what? Before I do anything, why don't you introduce yourself, bro? Introduce yourself to the family. I'm not sure if I can match that energy, but I'm going to do my best. Come on now. Bring right. it. Yes, sir. So, um, Hello, <laughs> um, my name is Cordero Taylor. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I own a private practice out here in Riverside County. It's called Lemonade Counseling Services. So what we specifically do, we treat and specialize in treating trauma-based mood disorders and anxiety-based disorders. We specifically use three different types of practices. is cognitive behavioral therapy, solution-focused and behavioral therapy all combined in one. We primarily treat minorities, uh, specifically African-American, Latino, male and female. We provide a lot of individual couples and family therapy. Primarily, it is virtual, but we do have face-to-face -face services as well. So it's kind of a collective. I'm from Long Beach. Um, which is, yes, right. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, graduated from USC with my master's in social work. And what age? At what age? I got to pause you. What age? Because that was one of the greatest accomplishments, in my opinion. At what age? I think it was 24, 25, wow. something like amazing. that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank Absolutely you. Absolutely amazing. And right now, just continuing to walk in my purpose and fulfill the goals that I have set for myself, but then also fulfill the bigger purpose for my life, which is continuing to service and be a service to people and specifically individuals of color. So thank you for having me on your show. Man, I appreciate you being here, man. And, and just... To kind of give context to, to why you are here, 
Um, as of the recording of this video, I was working on the Self-Employed Business Academy, and one of the modules in the course is dealing with the emotions of what a self-employed individuals go through. And so as I was doing it, of course, I am not the expert. So I reached out to my bro here who is the expert. And we had a very in-depth, intelligent conversation about dealing with emotions, um, not just as a business owner, but just as, as human beings, period. And, I, and, and the conversation that he brought to me based on my set of questions, I was like, man, this is something that needs to be discussed in our community, in the self-employed community, because if you aren't doing well as an individual, your business won't do well because they are one in the same, right? Uh -huh. So what, 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 what I have my brother here for is to kind of help us understand how to deal with these emotions that we go through so we can have a good balance in life. If that makes sense, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, I've already pre-prepped him, told him I'm going to ask some very hard questions, but of course he already ready for me. <laughs> Man, so let's, let's go ahead and get to it. The first question that I want to put on the table is the benefits. You know, what are the benefits of having healthy emotional balance? I think you just mentioned it before in terms of just having a well-rounded life. Emotional balance isn't just related to one component or one area of your life, it's all around. So if we're looking at business, the better you are as an individual, the better your business will be because you're having more balance in that one area. But it's not just applicable towards business, it's applicable right. towards your family, it's applicable towards your friendships, it's applicable with your relationship with God, it's applicable with the people who you are developing any other business relationship with because it's all around your life. So the better balance you have when it comes to your emotional um, awareness, your emotional intelligence, the way that you regulate your emotions and the way that you manage them, the more likely the other areas of your life will be a lot more suited to help you fulfill your goals in life. Really? Okay. So, so man, I, I felt like just, just even with that, there is a, a, such a great benefit to it, but it's not talked about, uh -huh. right? Like it's, uh -huh. it's, it's not, it's, it's, uh, uh, an underserved market, right? Especially, and I hate to say it, but I'm gonna say it anyway, amongst men, you know, uh -huh. that that therapeutic is is is, is frowned upon, right? Is it's not uh it's not manly to go seek therapy because if you're having, you know, therapy, if you go and see the therapy, something wrong with you, right? Uh -huh. Like there's always that stigma. But if we can get past that, there's there's so much more of a benefit, so much more of a healthy. Uh, uh, lifestyles. It's funny that you mentioned that because I had just had a conversation with um, uh, uh, Terrell Turner, CPA, and we was talking about because he, he offers CFO services, right? And it's funny, he mentioned that really, if we do things right, there's a lot of stress that can be relieved, right? Like he, he offered again, CFO, a chief financial officer. He offers it to small businesses. And he was saying just by knowing numbers, just by being able to uh, alleviate that one thing, so much stress gets alleviated just by that one thing. And here we are, you telling us that just, just another one thing, having that emotional balance can really put you in a place, not just in business, but your entire life. That's a, that's a very deep perspective for me, right? Like, uh -huh. I, you know, it's just one thing changes everything. Uh -huh. That's interesting. Uh -huh. That, that, that it is, is interesting. Um, it is. Cause it, I'm sorry. I can't, uh -huh. I don't, I don't want to intervene. I, well, this is one thing that we practice when mental health and specifically when it comes to the, exploration and the process of just working through any type of past trauma. It's an ongoing process. You know, we can say it's one thing, but that one thing opens up the door for another thing. But in order for you to get to step 
two, you have to be able to get through step one. So that way you're better prepared for step two. So yes, if we are able to have a perspective that it's a journey opposed to the end goal, this is just a process that I'm gonna to have to go through so that way I can improve. Cause no one's ever gonna be perfect. So there is no end line, there's no finish, you know, there's no end to that. But as long as we have a perception that we can be able just to take it one step at a time to get to the bigger picture, to get to the closest we can get to, to the happiness in this life, it makes it a lot easier for us to not anticipate this grand um, finish because we know that it's a process. So when I hear you talk about the idea of just doing one thing, um, I would have to say a little bit differently when it comes to mental health because it's not just one thing that one thing allows you to be a little bit better prepared and emotionally able and psychologically a little bit more um self-intuitive so that way as you get to the next phase you are better able to cope with the next phase because there could be another door that at least another area of trauma that you may not have been ready for if you would have not went through that first step Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, enlightenment, right? I, I, like I knew this, I knew it was gonna happen, so I'm I'm ready for it, right? Because again, I'm be transparent. Like I don't believe I've ever had um, an actual what's the term I'm looking for? Like, well, I've sat down and understood the process of going through finding my emotional health and balance. Right. Never did. Even though me and you, we talk all the time and man, and our conversations be excellent, but we we've, we've never had that, I guess, professional setting where I'm laying across the chair and you're sitting there with your pen and pad. Right. Like we, we never done that, but that's, that's, that's good insight. So I like the fact that you said there is no end. Cause honestly, you know, I can't speak for everybody. I'll speak for myself, but I honestly thought there was like, if I can do this, then that is my solution. But I like the fact that you said that, no, there is no end um, because nobody's perfect. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Right. Wow. Wow. That really just blew right. up right there. Um, so seeing that, even me right now, having this conversation, just off that first question, is, is having some revelations, uh -huh. right? So how does the average person, which I guess a segue to my next question, recognize emotional, their emotions or, or, or emotional intelligence? Because I've heard that term before. Can you kind of give us an insight as to what is emotional intelligence and how do we recognize it? Or is it even recognizable? Yes, it is. We all notice it and we all feel it but we may not be aware of what it is or what is causing it. And oftentimes we kind of look at it as, I'm just not feeling okay, I'm upset, I'm angry, I'm, I'm annoyed. I don't really feel like being around people. I don't wanna talk right now. We conceptualize it as just a mood shift. But if we look at what emotional intelligence is, it breaks down that there is an understanding of why we are experiencing that emotion. We just don't feel things as feel them. There's a cause and there's an effect, right? So if we end up having some type of, um, we're at home and we're with our woman and for some reason we start to feel annoyed, it's not just because we're annoyed, it's because something has happened to make us annoyed. And that annoyance could be a trigger for something else that happened before you even met that woman. It could have been oh. something that was stemming from your childhood. So. The emotional intelligence comes from being able to one, taking a moment and just looking at what is happening within me. What am I actually feeling, right? And putting a name to it. If I'm feeling annoyed, let me just not call it I'm mad. Or I'm feeling stressed or I feel like don't be in let me Let me actually name the emotion. Once we start to name the emotion and we start to look at why am I feeling this way and kind of go down that, that breadcrumb trail, we probably were able to see that it comes from a specific place. This is the intelligence of just looking at why am I experiencing that emotion? And now what can I do with this emotion? Because if I am projecting this, whatever trigger onto whomever else I'm interacting with, then that's not intelligent because that person more than likely didn't do anything wrong. This has nothing really to do with them. This is more than likely an unresolved issue that I never really confronted or addressed. It takes time to get to this. So it goes back to my original statement of just having one step at a time 
Because if you see that I gave kind of a little bit of a path, but those paths take steps and you have to be emotionally ready for what you're going to uncover. And that takes a little bit of time. So this is kind of the process of therapy, of just taking the time that you need so that way you can be able to get to a point of growth and insight so that way you can be ready for the next phase. Wow. You do realize you said a whole lot right there, right? I did. And, and I wasn't even done. I cut it short. I, I, still, I, I, still, I, I still want to talk about the, the stigma of mental health and not, you know, people are really not talking about it. And honestly, that is, it's changed. It's changed so much. It's becoming a little bit more of a normalcy to talk about it. Before it was cultural, where it was frowned upon to seek therapy. But if you think about all the ways that, and you gave the example of men, of how men decipher through life, it's not just I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna be quiet and you know suffer in silence, I'm gonna deal with my problems alone. There's always been some form of therapy, but it may have not been traditional therapy. You go to the barbershop, you're talking to your boys about how things are going with your lady or with your kids or whoever it may be with law enforcement. There's always some form of support. You talk to your older brother, you talk to the big homie. You may talk to your father if he was around. There's always some type of support. We may have not called it the traditional setting of therapy, but now it's becoming more common. We're doing it right now. All right. This is a part of that process of really changing the perception of what mental health is to not make it a stigma or it's negative and it's taboo, but it's actually more acceptable and needed. Um, the more I'm looking at television, the more I'm looking at social media, um, even the book that I told you about, Will Smith's new book, it's all about mental health. It's all about addressing what's really happening within us and looking at why we do what we do. And it's so, so healthy and so needed and so helpful. So I have to disagree a little bit. The stigma of mental health is starting to shift where it's a lot more acceptable to talk about these things. Wow, wow. Well, you know what? Uh, uh, that's good because so <laughs> I'm trying to gather my thoughts because because you, you're putting me here and here. The thoughts are going all over the place. Going back to the stigma, it's good to know that the the conversations that we're having, right, is a part of mental health, right? Mm -hmm. or, or could, is it possible to say, when we talk about mental health, I wanna talk about, is it, are conversations healing, right? Is, is, can, can we say that when you have conversations, um, you are going through a healing process? Is, is, that, is that the proper terminology? Maybe not, I feel like it's not, but I feel like just say mental health, that's not addressing the actual issue, right? So, but when you're having a conversation, what exactly is that doing? It's opening up the door for a deeper conversation. It's opening up the door for a possibility of it being redirected to something else. Not everybody you talk to, unfortunately, is gonna give really, really good advice or be able just to have an empathetic ear where they can understand where you're coming from. So, of course, as hopefully we are taking the time to be a little bit more aware of who we're communicating these things to. If you know that your friend is not the best person to talk to, because all they talk about is just money and women, and you're going through some really difficult times with, you know, the loss of your father, that person is not the right person to talk to. But maybe your cousin who understands grief, because they've also experienced a lot of loss in their life, and they've been working through it in, the, in probably one of the healthiest ways that you've ever seen in your life maybe they're the better person to talk to. So we're able to have a little bit more clarity and decipher who's the best person to talk to. Then it can lead to a hopeful healing conversation or even a redirection. I may not be the best person to talk to about this, but it sounds like maybe talking to a professional, talking to a therapist could be helpful. I know it did for me or whatever that conversation may lead to, but it can open up the door. So would that be part of, emotional intelligence because when i think of emotional intelligence i'm thinking of being able to make rational decisions about the way you're feeling right so so, so that's that's my take on emotional intelligence so again like you just stated one being willing to have the conversation but then uh -huh. two the intelligence side comes in when you say hey not only am i going to be open to have the conversation but i have to choose the right person to have this conversation with. And it don't uh -huh. necessarily have to be 
a, 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 a licensed therapist or somebody like that, but it could be a family member who's been through it and I've uh-huh. witnessed them go through it successfully, I guess. Uh-huh. Wow. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, and when we talked about emotional intelligence, you talked about triggers, yeah. identifying triggers. Like, again, this is part of understanding that. And you said something that we should take a moment and try to identify the trigger. How? Like, if you're in the moment, right, like you and, and you don't have that experience, you, you've, you've not used to talking, you're not used to really opening up. How do you really take a moment, right? Because even with myself, like today we started the conversation, you asked how you feeling. I said, I'm feeling overwhelmed. I ain't never uh-huh. took a moment, never have I took a moment to understood where that is coming from. Never uh-huh. really knew I had to, to be honest with you. I was just like, this is, this is how I'm feeling and I'm about to go do some damage because, you know, it's starting to build up. I got to release this somehow, some way. Never, never thought about taking a moment. So uh-huh. outside of just doing, taking a moment, how, how, if that makes sense. It, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it goes right back to the original statement that it's all levels. It takes, it's just one step at a time and we're people, we're imperfect. So we're not going to know exactly what to do every single time and every single moment. So we're going to go through this trial and error phase where we try something, we do it. It doesn't work try it again, doesn't work, try it again. Sometimes it takes a while for us to actually learn the lesson. So maybe just, mu- you know, um, muscling our way through that emotion is not probably the best option. So now that we're having a real look at why am I feeling overwhelmed, we can probably see that just kind of going through it is not the best course of action. So maybe I know the feeling of being overwhelmed and mental health, we call that somatic symptoms. You're going to experience some type of physical um, indicator that you are overwhelmed with stress, your um, your chest might feel a little tight, you may still, you may, your heart may start beating a little faster, your shoulders might feel a little tense. You start feeling these physical indicators of Finger stress. Tingling. Exactly, right? Yeah. <laughs> so these are indicators. These are little bits of, um, of body cues that let you know that something's not quite right in me, right? I can feel it, I know it, because I can feel the sense of stress. Let me push pause because if I continue and just muscle through the day, I know what that's going to lead to because I've done that before. So the idea of emotional intelligence is just being able to know your pattern, right? And sometimes it has to be pointed out to you. Sometimes we have to take a moment and ask ourselves, what am I actually doing? Why am I feeling this way? It's not that easy to be able to do unless somebody kind of guides you through it sometimes. But just taking the time we need is to look at what's happening in because obviously I'm feeling overwhelmed and stressed. Yeah. But the more I feel this way, the more my stress starts to build. And it's not really going anywhere. There's moments where it'll go away, but then it comes right back. Am I handling my stress the best way? If I'm not, let me take a moment and let me look at what are some alternatives? What are some other things that I can do to be able to handle this? But it starts with having that, that awareness that something's not quite right. Let me see what's overwhelming me. I have this deadline. I have this project coming up. We have Christmas and all these shopping. I haven't done anything. I haven't ordered this on Amazon yet. <laughs> I still need to wrap gifts, right? Um, I still haven't paid you know, the car note yet. There's so many different things, right? And it like starts to become very overwhelming. Exactly, because I go through the same exact stuff, right? <laughs> so, but taking the time that we need just to have a self-care check-in. What's going on with me? How am I doing? I'm overwhelmed, I'm stressed. Okay, what's stressing me? I got all these bills, got all these responsibilities, have all these tasks. Okay, I see it for what it is. What can I do to handle this a little differently? Because I know that the stress, it really affects me negatively. So how do I work through this? That's what that moment is all about. Wow, wow. I like that. So so one thing I just took from that and from that going back to the beginning is the fact we have to pay attention to our bodies because our bodies, if from what, from my understanding, we can really, when I say, how do we know when to really step back and, 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 and take that time, our bodies would be the trigger, not necessarily the trigger, but the indicator, right? Like uh-huh. for me, I know I get tingling in my feeling. I just kind of be like, oh, something going on with my hand, but I never really associated it 
with the the fact that okay, I'm starting to get overwhelmed now because because here comes that that tingle in my hands. Let me take a moment, step back, see what's happening. Like you said, yeah, I see everything. I got this bird's eye view. Let me take a step back from this, and at that point, figure out how to like, deal with it differently. Mm-hmm. Nice. Mm-hmm. Nice. Mm-hmm. And yes, that, that. that's all a part of the emotional health or emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. Nice. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's not all of it, but it's definitely a part of identifying how to handle the emotion of feeling overwhelmed and feeling burdened and feeling um, probably um, not even just stressed, just feeling as if sometimes I'm incapable. Sometimes I don't know how to do it. I'm confused. I feel angered or I feel frustrated. I'm, I'm tense. Just identifying exactly what that feeling is and then breaking it down a little bit. So that way it's easier to kind of work through a maneuver. So again, you brought up something else where I'm gonna have to ask here. How many emotions are there to be able to recognize? It's only five. <laughs> oh, I don't know, there's so many. There's, there's, <laughs> there's, there's synonyms to all these. I said mad, mad, frustration, um, anger, um, pissed off, there's vexed, um, there's the term, there's so many synonyms just to describe one emotion. And that one emotion can be a level to the emotion because there's like low, medium, high levels of feeling upset and angry. So there's a, a gamut of different words to describe all these different emotions. But if we can just be able to have an idea of what the real emotion is, right? right. The real emotion is what we're actually looking at. Yes, I'm feeling angry, but is that really what you're feeling? Or are you feeling incapable? Because there's so many things that you have on your plate, but you feel like it's too overwhelming. You feel challenged by it. And you may feel internally that you can't do it. Is that really the real emotion that you're feeling? This is how we start to unravel what's really happening within that person. And once we start to have that honest conversation, and sometimes that honesty hurts, and it's a hard, hard truth, but the more we are able to see it and accept it for what it is, the less we're pushing away from how we actually are, and the easier life can become because we're not running from the real. We're not running from the truth. We're actually kind of accepting it and maybe embracing it. And by doing that, it can allow us to overcome it. Wow. Wow. So, so that is, uh, sounds like a difficult process once you do on their own, which kind of leads me to my next question, man. Um, you know, at what point should somebody consider seeking professional help? Cause like you said, you, what if we don't know how to recognize, like I say overwhelmed, but what if it is, I'm feeling incapable. I, I never even thought about that. You know, that's why I said, like, exactly how many emotions are even possible? Because I didn't even know the feeling of being incapable is something that I would tie to being emotional. Right. So um, at what point, again, just just kind of asking the question again, should somebody be seeking professional help? In our world, we put things in, in an And unfortunately, it's kind of putting label and boxes on things. But the reality is that we have to look at how these, we call them symptoms, how these symptoms are affecting your life, right? So to kind of put it into perspective of how this affects business, for instance, if that person is feeling um, incapable, if they're having this insecurity about what they're capable of, and they may not have as much confidence or self-acceptance that they actually can do it then it can start to, it can lead to that person being laxed when it comes to completing their work, completing their assignments, following up people, responding to emails. And that can lead to them losing potential clients, losing contracts, losing opportunity. And now it's starting to affect their life in a negative way because of that internal feeling that I am incapable. So this is where the idea of when the, I guess when is the best time, but just identify exactly why that emotion is there, but then looking at how is this affecting my life? 
once you start to see that it's affecting that person's life in a negative way, more than likely, this is the time to start looking at how do I obtain support? Because it's not just an emotion I'm struggling with. Now it's affecting my money. It's affecting the way that I take care of my family. It's affecting the growth of my business, right? So in mental health, we call these impairments. They're functional impairments. They affect my functioning negatively. So this is more than likely the time to start looking for support. Okay. I hope that example made sense. I tried to break it down, but I'm not sure if it was too long, but no, I hope no, that example makes sense. All. Not at all, man. I mean, um, just make sure to reiterate. So when we start to see it manifesting in other ways then, right? Like it's, this is no longer just about me and my mental. This is no longer just about me and uh, what I'm feeling of physical. This is starting to manifest itself in other ways. Like I can now start to see my business is starting to decline because of I have something unchecked going on with me personally, like my, my marriage or my relationships are starting to really go downhill because I have something that I have unchecked and things like that. Once we see that start to manifest now is when we should seek out uh, professional help, right? Mm -hmm. Chronic, yes. Chronic disorder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. That is okay. that is one of the. It's not easy to identify because in our minds we are all our hero. We are the the, the hero of our story of life. Right. So to look at ourselves honestly and say these are the things that I'm struggling with. This is how it affects me negatively. Is easier said than done, and I'm simplifying it. But that's not how life works. We are often in denial. We are often having this, you know, this perception that we can do these things and we may not be aware that it's affecting our lives in a negative way. We can think of it as the man is not, you know, giving me a chance or people um, don't see the work of my business yet. And um, if only if I had that one client, things would be different. We mm. seem to put it on the external opposed to taking a moment and saying, okay, how is this a reflection of me? Because this is kind of a pattern. I see it in, or I've been told, maybe that person doesn't see it, but I've been told that this is happening in business. This is happening in my relationship with my woman. This is happening with my kids. This is happening with my friends. This is a pattern. What does it say about me? What's happening within me that this is reoccurring, right? So I would say that, yes, having these impairments to be displayed and you can see it is definitely one of the best times. However, it's still a good practice just to see, is there anything that I need to address in life in general? Are there any areas that I could be feeling that is unaddressed? Especially if we start to notice that there's an ongoing emotion. I'm feeling very frustrated all the time. Maybe that's a clue that there's something not quite right in you. So possibly talking to somebody could be helpful with that. So I would say that the small signs are probably the tip of the iceberg. So maybe at that small indicator, looking for a little bit of support at that time, because it could be minimal or it could be, again, a very big iceberg that's lurking underneath that has been really unaddressed and has a lot of unresolved trauma that could be looked at. Got you. Got you, man. It sounds like you're really trying to uh, tell people to to look at the person in the mirror. Uh -huh. And I, I, I'll be honest with you in the spirit of transparency, man, I found that to be a very difficult thing to do. You know, uh -huh. sometimes still, I find that to be a very difficult thing to do. I did it some years ago, and that's, you know, came to the realization that things had to change for me. But looking at the person in the mirror, man, he, you know, it's funny. We look in the mirror every day. When we uh -huh. get dressed, brushing our teeth, doing our hair, you know, doing whatever, we see ourselves. But I noticed with me, I would look in the mirror, but I would not make eye contact with myself when I was looking in the mirror. And I was like, why is that? It's me, like I love me, right? I love who I am, but I couldn't make eye contact with myself looking in the mirror. And then one day going through something, didn't know what it was, didn't have the emotional intelligence to recognize it. I looked at myself in the mirror and that was one of the most difficult things for me to experience as a human being, as just as a person, whether 
man, black man or nothing, just me being who I am. It was like, man, that was that was hard because I was forced to really ask myself questions. Like, who are you? What are you doing? What is going on? Why hasn't this happened? Why are you still here? Why haven't you achieved uh-huh. this? What, wh- who are you? You know, yeah. what, what is your purpose? Like, why are you here? Why do you exist? Um, and it, it was, it was, it was, it was bad. It was, it was deep. Cause I was in a real, um, I don't want to say depressive state. I don't, don't think I've ever experienced depression, man, but I was like down. You know, mm-hmm. down in the dumps, and but it it was after that experience, I felt so much better. Mm-hmm. I got so much clarity. Like the, it, it it was those questions I asked myself that I forced myself to answer, which then gave me goals. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so it was like, man. So now I encourage all my kids, but y'all look in the mirror. You know, don't just look at yourself and say that. No, really look at yourself and ask those questions, right? Because it was, even though it was a hard experience for me or hard thing to do, I'm so grateful that I did it. But I'll yeah. be honest with you, since, since we you know we're talking about mental health, I've been scared to do it again. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> just the, because. The truth is hard, man. Uh, it, it, the it, truth. it definitely is. Yes, no one wants to hear the truth about themselves, but no one wants to hear it. No one wants to see it. It's easier to be able to look at other people in their situation and point the finger, right? Yeah. Or even yeah. whatever relationship you're in, to say that you're doing this and you're doing that. And because of you, this is not happening. But to reverse that finger or hold up a mirror and say, this is what, what am I doing? to contribute to this. Oh, that truth is hard. Oh, it hurts too. Because again, we're our heroes in our own minds. We tell our story and we are the victorious ones. It's never really our fault. Right, never. right. Right? Not my fault, you know? I do nothing. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I did the best that I could or I'm still working at it. You know, we make excuses. We um, find ways to intellectualize it or emotionally reason, right? Mm-hmm. Or to minimize what we're doing. but. The truth can be far from that. It's not a bad experience. It's very, very much needed. However, you're so right that it's so hard to do because now we have to deal emotionally with all the things that we have been avoiding. There was a reason why you couldn't look yourself in your eyes. There was a reason. And the more we avoided that eye contact, the more we continued to suppress what was really happening. So we didn't have the opportunity to deal with the emotion that we were avoiding. Now, when we take the time to look at ourselves in the mirror and look in our eyes and see, let me see my soul. Let me see what's happening within me. Let me ask these real questions. Now you're going to have this flood of emotions, more than likely, just because you've never really dealt with them. And that can be a very difficult process to deal with while still living life. Yeah. Because now emotionally you're thrown off and that affects you psychologically, which affects your behaviors. So it is challenging but I love the way that you put it into perspective that it allowed you to have healing. It allowed you to be able to face some hard truths that was difficult to face. But because of that, you were able to come out of the other side a little bit more victorious, a little bit more empowered, a little bit more directed because you were willing to look at yourself a little bit more honestly. And because of that, there was a lot more self-awareness, a little bit more um, insight, to what you have been struggling with, maybe a little bit more of a readiness to face some of those things that you've been avoiding, which can add, add to your self-esteem, which can add to your self-encouragement, it can add to your self-confidence, and then which can lead to you having better self-improvement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because I after that, I did see some growth and just, just in myself as an individual, man. And I was like, wow, uh, you know, I didn't want to sound, you know, overconfident, but there was some definite growth and development within me as an individual, you know, right. which trans, like you say, once we do that with ourselves, it translates so into so many other things, right? Just uh, me being a better husband, a better father, a better business person, right? Building better relationships in business, you know, right. doing all these things because I had that revelation, Man, it is definitely so. I I encourage, and I'm sure you know, bro would agree. If you haven't looked in the mirror yet, do so. 
do so with honesty, you know, uh, take a breather because it's, it's, it's going to be an eye opener, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, prepare uh -huh. for it. Um, uh -huh. Can I add to that really quick? Absolutely. Yes. Looking in the mirror, having that honest conversation. I always refer to it as just having an honest conversation with yourself. Let me just be real with myself. If I can't be real with everybody else because everybody may not get me. People may not understand. I may not want to be vulnerable with people because I can't trust people. Let me take a moment. Let me just have an honest conversation with myself. Why am I like this? Why do I feel this way? Why do I feel so alone? Why do I feel bothered when these things happen? Let me just have an honest conversation with myself. The more we can be real and have an honest conversation with ourselves, the easier it will be to look in the mirror, the easier it will be to face some of these truths. But it's not an easy process. And it's, it's a gradual step-by-step -step process. Because like you mentioned, you haven't done it since then. Mm -hmm. You did it. It was hard to get to that point. But then you did it and it helped. And now there's a little bit more growth. But again, we're human, we're ever evolving. We're never quite complete, we're imperfect by nature. Right. So it has got you ready for the next level, right? So when and if that time comes for you to look at yourself in the mirror again, you'll probably be a little bit more ready for that time because you had this time as a reference to say, I can get through it because I did it before and I can get through it again when I'm ready. So it's all about just taking the progressive time in mental health and therapy, we call that pacing. Just one step at a time. When you're ready, you'll know. I like that. The one step at a time. That is. So you you mentioned something, vulnerability. Uh -huh. Which I think is what a lot of people run from. Like no, Ugh. nobody wants to be vulnerable for anything, right? Like that that leaves us exposed for embarrassment, for shame, for guilt, right? How do how do we get to the point where we can face being vulnerable? Because if we can't deal with our vulnerabilities, how can we ever really move forward with our emotional it intelligence? It starts with that honest conversation. That honest conversation. People, we all do it. I'm not going to say people because as if I'm not a part of that. I am very much a part of that too. We all, again, are our heroes in our minds. So we will make ourselves seem to be one thing and the truth could be far from that. So to go back to your question of how do we actually allow ourselves to be vulnerable, it starts with that honest conversation. That honest conversation is a moment of vulnerability. Mm. I am not as good as I think I am. I am not as handsome as I think I am. I am not as smart. I am not as um, um, brave as I think I am. And that's okay. The more we can have more self-acceptance, the easier it will be for us to display our vulnerabilities to other people because we are not ashamed of it as much anymore because we see it within ourselves and we faced it. So it makes it easier to be a little bit more vulnerable. The word vulnerable has this connotation of being weak and, and being inferior. And it's quite the opposite. It is quite the opposite. It actually allows you to be stronger. The, the, the strongest people we know in life who get through life and they seem to handle it in ways that we admire are some of the most vulnerable people, mm. are some of the most honest individuals because they're not running from their truth. Your vulnerability by looking in the mirror, because that's a moment of vulnerability because mm. you're looking at your truth and you're vulnerable in that space, allowed you to feel pain because that truth was hard to face. But after you work through it, you were able to feel a little bit stronger, yeah. a little bit more capable, which allowed you to talk about it openly in this setting. So you can be able to share your testimony, which can be helpful for other people. It's a moment of strength. We look at that word vulnerability as if it's a weakness, but it's not. It actually grows you as a person. It helps you develop. So I think that's how we get through it. It's just taking the time to have an honest conversation and reprocessing and redefining that word of being vulnerable. It's just honestly, let me just be real. And that's okay. It's okay to be real, but it's un. It's not okay to be vulnerable. They're both the same thing. <laughs> wow. Wow. Man. Okay. Again, I you keep giving me these nuggets and I'm feeding on it because you said something a few seconds ago about self-awareness, right? Being vulnerable leads to self-awareness. And when you are self-aware at that point, you become powerful. You know, one of my greatest quotes, uh, Mark, Mark Twain, I do believe is the author of this quote that says, you know, the two most important days of a person's life 
is the day they are born and then the day they find out why, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Understanding their purpose, their, their, their self-awareness. Um, and then we talked about vulnerability being a powerful tool. And I know you were reading that the book by Will Smith. And at this point, during as the recording of this video, Will Smith is in the media a lot because of the fact that he's being open about what's happening in his life personally. And he's exposing, I don't want to say the word exposing because to me that's almost negative too, but he's being very open about what's been happening and, and being vulnerable to us as his fans. Right. Uh -huh. So, um, and have what you read in that book so far, do you see where his vulnerability has really strengthened him? Could, could that be an example? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's you, you've heard of the statement that truth shall set you free. Yes. There's so many chains, trauma chains we, we, we carry with us. And the more we carry them and the more we live through our trauma, the more we respond to our trauma, the more we develop relationships to our trauma, the more we react to our trauma, the more chains we seem to carry and the more we reinforce that same trauma. What Will Smith is doing in this book, <laughs> what he's doing is having that honest conversation about why he is the way that he is. And, and you mentioned exposing, but I refer to it as freeing himself mm -hmm. of all of these, these chains of, I need to be this picture perfect image of what a black successful entertainer looks like. I don't have to be I don't have to be charming. I don't have to be um, perfect. I don't have to be spotless. I don't have to be the Fresh Prince. I can be Will Smith, and that's okay. Got it. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure if that part makes sense. I can be me. Yeah. I can just be me, and that's okay. I don't have to be any more than that. Just being myself, and that's okay. But it, that's a process, bro. It is a very, it's a, it can be a very difficult process. He articulates very clearly, not only in the text, but then also in the show, um, um, The Best Shape of My Life, that it's been some of the most emotionally exhausting and revealing steps I had to go through. And it, it, it breaks you down. It breaks you down to the point where you have this persona of yourself in your mind. And you realize that that's not who I really am. And I've been ashamed to be who I really am. And that hurts, that hurts you. It affects you emotionally. So it's not as simple as I'm self-aware, now I'm powerful. I have more awareness, but now I have to feel the weight of my self-awareness. I have to grieve who I formerly was and deal with the pain that I've been fronting a lot. I've been this persona, I've been this, this idea of who I wanted to be. And that's not who I really am. That process, is painful so it takes steps to get to that space of feeling empowered but it's all worth it it's all helpful it's all needed but it's really just dismantling and taking away these chains and you know what happens after that man i, I i'm from I'm, I'm feeling good like i'm feeling this 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 joy feeling to come over me just having the conversation when you talk about taking the chains of trauma off right facing your 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 past self and be like you know I don't really have to be that I don't have to put on this front no more I can really be me it's not necessarily strength but it's it's the joy of freedom yes like, no nobody can you can't say nothing that's going to change the way I feel right now there there's nothing you can say nothing you can say nothing you can do that's going to make me go back to that place uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? Like that's that's what I'm getting from that man. And that's a good thing. Uh, I don't even. You know, I feel like my voice didn't even got elevated because the excitement of that, just knowing that if I do that, if I have that release, if I go through that practice, I'm good. I'm good. Even yes, there are steps, hard steps, difficult steps. But if I take those steps, I'm good. Yes, I and can be better, and, and that's my goal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes, you mentioned you mentioned freedom. That's a powerful word. Have you ever did that before where you've been holding something back and you wanted to say it to whoever you wanted to say it to and you finally did? 
And sometimes we say it in the worst ways ever, but oftentimes we can say it in a way that just got our fun across and we feel better. We feel lighter. We feel free. We feel yeah. like a weight was lifted because yeah. the truth self sets you free. It's just having that honest conversation and being able to accept that this is how I am. This is how I feel. There's nothing wrong with it. Let me live in it. And we would start to release a lot of that, those re- those re-traumatizing moments, those re-traumatizing thought processes, those reinforcements that we're not good enough and I'm unlovable, whatever it may be, we start to release that and become a little bit more self-accepting, which helps kind of get us to the next phase. Gotcha, gotcha, absolutely. Man, that's, that's yeah, I feel good about that. All right, um, so so let me ask this this question here, man, is there, some things we should be aware of. like like social media is huge right now and social media has a lot of influence over individuals right i mean think about the key word social media influencer right like that that is a common term well, i'm an influencer is there something that we can do practical things to help us keep our emotions in check and, and, I, and I brought up social media to try to see, is there, should we limit social media, right? Because social media is very influential, it's very impactful, right? Like I, I hear it on talk radio all the time, social media is causing people depression. Uh, you know, they, they, they look at people oh, and because I'm not like this person, I must not be good and it's causing you know, all kind of negative things to happen because individuals are not aware. They don't have their self-awareness, right? They haven't had that honest conversation. They didn't look in the mirror. They haven't freed themselves of the trauma chains, right? Um, what should we be doing to, to make sure that we protect ourselves, I guess? Or is there anything we can do? Let me kind of work through that question because it's a heavy question and it's layered. What okay. can we do? So just to make sure that I'm clear, the question is what can we do that's practical, practical steps to create more emotional balance? Is that what I'm hearing from you or is it something different? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I guess so. Uh, I wonder like how should we, how should we tread this earth? You know, seeing that there's there's all kind of things coming at us, right? Trying to tell us this is who you should be. This is how you should act. This is uh, the image you should strive for, right? Like you're not good enough because you're not this. Like we, every day that we wake up, we are faced with those things. Mm -hmm. right? So, so what, what can we do? Right. Okay. Hair sticking up. Um, I, I made your hair with, rise up. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. With that question, we're assuming that that person wants to do anything about it. Because yeah. we're not just talking to everyone, right? right. We're, the right. assumption is that that person wants to not feel that way, not to feel inferior. They want to feel better about themselves. They're getting tired of living life the way that they're living. They're getting tired of feeling the way that they're feeling. So that assumption comes along with that question. Yeah. Everybody's going to fit into that box. Okay. So with that person having that desire to be better, then there's already an awareness that something is not right. Okay. So following that instinct, following that and allowing themselves again to say, what's not right? What am I not happy with in my life? What is not happening in my life at this point that I'm not pleased with that I could be doing differently that I am allowing what makes me unhappy following that voice following that that instinct that intuition that something's not quite right that's the first step so that way it can kind of guide you because everybody's path is different everybody's path is going to look different so there isn't a specific thing that I can say this is a practical thing that everybody can do Gotcha. That's not kind of, you know, that, that, that practicality doesn't work because it looks different for everybody. But I would say in terms of our human instinct, noticing that something's not quite right and allowing themselves to see where it goes by asking some of these hard questions, what's not right exactly? Why do I feel this way? 
I hit all these influences and all the people telling me I should live this way, I should be this way, that I should feel this way. Do I actually want to feel that way? Mm. Do I want to fit into this norm? What's, why do I feel uncomfortable with that? Or why, when I do it, I don't feel quite right. I still feel like I'm faking. I still feel like I'm not me. Um, I feel like I'm still not good enough because I do it and then I still don't get the attention that I want. Because maybe it's not for you. Maybe what you're being fed is not for you. What actually makes you feel good about you? And answering that question and allowing some of these questions to unfold to lead you to another path, I think that will probably be the best or one of the first steps to take. Okay, okay. So so in, in, in our entire conversation, you have suggested that we ask ourselves a set of questions. So can we maybe say that's a starting point to have somebody, I would even suggest that folks maybe even kind of um, go back through what we just talked about and listen to the questions that you said that we should ask ourselves, write those down. And every time you feel like you're going through some, revisit those questions, right? And just see how far you can get with those questions. And maybe if you feel you can't get as far as you want to with the question, then, hey, we book an appointment with Lemonade Counseling, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I am here to be able to service. I'm here to be able to help. Even if there's an area that you're trying to work through, you're still stuck in a certain area, you can't really find the answer. Having a conversation can kind of help unfold and unravel some of these things that are kind of hard to be able to see. Um, it's easier for somebody from the outside to kind of help you work through that opposed to somebody that's in the inside. Um, for instance, an unbiased perspective opposed to a friend or family member because they have a stake, they have a um, an investment in you, which changes a little bit of their perception. But having a external view with somebody who doesn't have that much knowledge about you, but just has a perception of what can be helpful or what's missing that you may not be seeing can help you look at yourself a little bit more clearly if you do get stuck. So yes, reaching out, making an appointment, um, having an idea of what you would like to actually look at when it comes to yourself, what you would like to face, what you want to have changed in your life, what you may want to see change about yourself. I think that's probably the biggest thing. What, what areas of your life do you want to make different? Not everybody else, but just you. What can I do differently in my life so that way I can get what I need, what I can get what I want, and life can be better? We can definitely help you with that. Gotcha. Well, all right, man. Well, that's, that was all the questions I had, big bro. I appreciate you being here, you know, to kind of even, even though this was more or less like interview style, ask some questions, help us out. I felt like it was another breakthrough for me. Cause like I said, towards the end, my energy, I was like, I got excited. I felt the joy come over because of that. The understanding that freedom is possible. Once these uh -huh. things kind of happen, once you, uh, face the realization that, yeah, there's trauma. Uh, I like the fact that, that you pointed out in the very beginning that, you know, we really have to identify our triggers, right? Like, yeah, I may be a whim, but what triggered that? How, how do we, I, it, it, it may not be the work. It may be coming from a, a place of being inadequate, right? And then how do mm -hmm. I deal with that? Which to me, it's excited because it's hope. Like, if you've been shooting at the wrong target the whole time, you're going to get frustrated because like, man, I'm supposed to be aiming here, but I'm aiming over here and I'm shooting. I'm like, why this thing ain't, ain't moving? Why it ain't disappearing? Why it's not, why am I not hitting it? Well, because the trajectory is off. You're supposed to be aiming here, but you aiming over here. So being able to identify and bring that in perspective to be able to hit the actual target, which, in this terms, the actual trigger, understanding what really brought that about. And once you understand uh -huh. that, now we have something that we can actually work on. And yeah. then understanding, too, that it's not an overnight process. And really, because nobody's perfect, it will never be an ending process. This this is ongoing, right, to, to the day you lay down for rest. This this is something we're going to be doing often. Right. And it's not a bad thing. 
It right. sounds daunting. It sounds heavy. It sounds long winded and it sounds like it's never going to end, but that's not what it's about. It's not when we accomplish a goal is when we accomplish that goal, more than likely that feeling of accomplishing the goal, it, it's not as grand. It's like, okay, I did it. Yay. I, I, I've done it. But that's not really the strongest feeling that you had. What normally is the takeaway is the journey that you experience and what you did to get there and the growth and the self-development and the in a sense of accomplishment and the sense of not giving up. That is what is the reward, but it's never really the end goal. We're people, we're never going to complete it. We're never going to just have a, like I'm finished. I learned all that I can learn. I'm as wise as I can be. I am the best that I ever can be in life. That's not how it works. And that's okay. It's supposed to be that way so we can grow. We can become better. Um, so I'm glad that you mentioned that. Also, when it comes to triggers, like you said, it's not really about the trigger. I'm glad that you mentioned that it's about what's behind the trigger. Why did this trigger me? The trigger more than likely has nothing to do with why you responded that way. It led to you seeing that there's a sensitive area here that's unaddressed. This whatever incident happened that triggered me is just letting me know that this area is unaddressed. Normally, the trigger is not really the issue. It's why did it trigger me, right? What does it say about me that I have not really resolved or why this affects me the way that it does? So good summarization. I'm happy to have this time with you, man, because this was a really good uh, discussion. <laughs> I want to have more of them. Yeah, I was about to say part two got to come again, man, because you you still hit on a lot of things that uh, we can talk about. Honestly, you you touched on a lot of things we can talk about. So I'll be happy to have you back as long as you be happy to be back, right? Because I know uh, Lemonade Counseling got you busy, you know, because you you are out there helping people, you saving the world, got your cape on, you know. So appreciate you, appreciate you. So where can we find you? We are at LemonadeCounselingServices.com. Okay. Um, that is the uh, official website. You can also reach out to us through email, LemonadeCounseling at gmail.com. You can contact us at 562-704-6779. Once again, 562-704-6779. Um, the Instagram and Facebook page will be developed soon, but for right now, you can reach out to us on our website, contact us through email, I'll call us directly, and we'll see what we can do to be able to support you. Got you, got you, man. Well, I sure appreciate you being on here, dropping them jewels, dropping them gems, helping us get our emotional balance, our emotional uh, intelligence, right? Again, I hope everybody was taking notes because... We just want you to be the best you you can be. And not to say mm -hmm. that that's going to be uh, perfect because we're not perfect. And I think that's something else we can have a whole different conversation on acceptance of the fact that perfection doesn't even exist, right? Like, I don't even know why the word was created because there is no such thing. But that's, you know, society sends to purport that, you know, perfection exists somewhere, but it doesn't. Like I said, that's a whole new conversation, but just knowing who you are, uh, releasing those trauma trains, trauma chains, getting that freedom to be able to just take a deep breath, smile, right? Just enjoy life, walk, out, walk outside and just take in the moment like, man, I'm actually above ground. I'm here. Look, I can, I can feel the wind. I can, man, all of that. Enjoy life. Yeah. Yes. No. Yes. Absolutely. We only get one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I said, that's something else we can talk about. We only get one. What you do with it? So, man. Yeah, you'll be back. But thank you. Thank you for having me, sir. I appreciate you, bro, bro. Absolutely. Perfect. Perfect. Perfect.